But these last few weeks, we've been reading from the John's uh, chapter 14 at the Gospel. This part of John's Gospel has been called Jesus' farewell discourse. He's saying goodbye to the 12. And it's a very appropriate time for for him to be doing that. Next weekend, we're we're going to be celebrating the Ascension. And they're thinking to themselves, how can we prepare ourselves for this time when he's not going to be with us anymore? Just imagine if you were saying goodbye to a dear friend and not knowing if you would ever see him or her again, and then maybe multiply that a thousand times. And maybe you feel a little bit sad, too, with this thought of Jesus departing from those whom he loved and who loved him. But the gospel is always good news, so this should not be heard as a sad reading. It's a hopeful reading. Jesus is encouraging us and challenging us as we question, Lord, where are you going? How can we follow you? I mean, Philip asked these questions, and I think we ask them too. And so Jesus tells us what we have to do. He says, if you keep my commands, that is, if you walk in the way that I taught you, If you live the life of love and giving, as I showed you, then I'm going to live in you, and you'll live in me, and we will be with the Father. So Jesus is saying he's not just going to be walking beside us, as great as that is. His living presence is going to be within us every day of our lives dwelling in us as the Holy Trinity dwells in love. The Father and the Son, the Son and the Father, and that indwelling, that intermingling, that powerful love is the Holy Spirit. So he's not saying, well, you know, the Holy Spirit and the Father and I have this special kind of love, and and we're going to love you too, but it won't be quite the same. No, he's saying, I want you to share in that love. I want you to be a part of it, to be there with us. It's at the very core of our faith. You see, we don't believe in a God who created everything there is from nothing and then stepped back, got out of touch, became remote, and left us on our own to do the best that we could. No, we believe in a God who knows us intimately, inside and out. We believe in a God who loved us to his death. For there is no greater love than for someone to give his life for a friend. That's what Jesus did for you and for me. We believe in a God who will never leave us as orphans. Now, yes, indeed, there is a transcendent aspect to God, a God beyond anything that we can imagine, any power, any intelligence, any knowledge, any holiness that we can think of. God is infinitely beyond that. And yet, and yet, he says, I am in the Father, you in me, and I in you. I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus wants to share more than anything this life that he shares with his Father and and share that with us. And I think we have that built-in yearning. It's why we're never satisfied with anything that we do in this life. There's always something more that we want. And this is the more. We are hardwired for this union with God. 
Well, how can we understand it? There's the way that we can sort of penetrate it and maybe feel it in our guts. It's one thing to sort of know it intellectually, and the theologians have done a magnificent job over the centuries to give us that kind of understanding, that cerebral uh, knowledge. But there's another way, too, that we can appreciate this love that Jesus wants to share with us. So let's use a few images. Let's see if that helps make it a little bit more real. Jesus always used very earthy images when he was telling stories because he wanted people to understand in their guts what he was talking about. So let's start with this one. You all know this image. He said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Well, we know what vines are. We can picture them climbing up the walls of buildings. We know that there's a main vine, and then from that trunk, all the other branches develop. They don't start on their own. They have to start from the main trunk. And as long as they stay connected, they're healthy. They participate in the life of that main trunk. And so it is with us. If you and I stay connected to Jesus, we will be sharing in his life, and he will be sharing in ours. That's how we stay spiritually healthy. But what about those people, and there are a lot of them, who somehow drop off the vine? Circumstances, their own choice, who knows why? But there are a lot of folks like that. What happens to them? Are they finished? Well, no, they're not. Remember, Jesus is also the good shepherd. He's always looking for the ones that are lost. Just think of the picture you're seeing of the good shepherd carrying the lost lamb on his shoulders back to the flock, back to be part of the vine again. Second image, bread and wine. Wasn't Jesus wise to use these most common foods that he would elevate to his body and blood so that they would be there to nourish us spiritually years, centuries after he was gone physically, and yet he is living with us as we participate in the Eucharist. We don't have to stare at the sky like the apostles will be doing next week and wonder where, where he went. We know where he will be, and that's within us. It's kind of the opposite thing that happens when we eat ordinary food. You know, when we eat food, it's broken down into its elements, and then it becomes part of us, part of our organs, our liver, our bones our blood, our brain, our heart. Ordinary food becomes us. But the divine food that Jesus gave us helps us to become him. The more often we eat the Eucharist, the more often we drink his blood, the more our thoughts, our will, our desires, our actions, become conformed to his. I am in the Father. You are in me. And I am in you. And finally, the last image is that of marriage. Marriage is a very familiar metaphor or image, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament for the relationship that God wants to have with us. Just a couple of quick examples. From the book of Genesis, in the very beginning of the Bible, in the, Im in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then from the great prophet Ezekiel, God says, 
I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you. You became mine, says the Lord God. And then St. Paul in Ephesians 5 tells us that Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her that she might be holy and without blemish. So a very common image, this idea that God wants to marry his people. And we know from our own experience the intimacy that spouses have for each other. We know those moments of feeling like we're totally in touch with that other person. We know them, they know us. And somehow the Creator wants that kind of experience for us, but not just in the moments, the brief moments that we enjoy here, but for all eternity. Can you imagine that kind of ecstasy? Jesus wants to draw us into eternal, to this eternal love relationship between Father, the Son, and the Spirit, to bring us all into that all-giving, all-receiving union where we shall know as we are known. It's all we ever wanted. And so as Jesus says goodbye, he's promising a deepening of our relationship with him beyond our wildest dreams. These images that we've talked about give us a taste and maybe it's the best we can do this side of heaven. But one day, one day for sure, all of us will share in the life of the Holy Trinity as branches on that vine, as living members of the body of Christ, and as intimate spouses of the Lord. I am in the Father. You are in me and I in you. It's all we ever wanted.